Is this TV material or website it's, uh, material? It's web video material, but okay. if it works... We'll put it everywhere. Put it everywhere. We're shameless. Alright, so... Tell me about the first time you and Kathy uh, professed your love for each other. In a sexual way. <laughs> I wanted to be as uncomfortable as possible. You know, like, what, how did that... There's a story there, but we're not going to get into it here on the web. <laughs> you want to become an attorney? Uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer and it's the uh, the idea of being able to join a profession where you actually help people and um, it's been a 31 year process at this point we're in our 31st year I find uh, each year is more rewarding than the previous year and I think we've achieved a lot of goals on behalf of our practice and our clients and uh, we're well positioned to keep going. Are there any cases over your history that particularly stood out where, you, where a client came to you and they had no hope and they didn't know what to do and you were not, even you were thinking, I'm really going to have to do my best here to, to, do, to get what's best for this client? Well, you know, that's, that's a great question and every case is an important case that we handle um, for people. But when you think about it over the course of uh, 30 years, there are cases that stand out. Most times, to be quite honest with you, it's uh, parents that have lost a child. Um, or Hang on one second. These guys chose this moment to grind up all of those tree parts. I, but the pile's going very quickly. I blame the insurance industry. I'm sure that it's part of a plan. A devious, dark master plan. Just as soon as, you start talking, as soon as we started talking, they fired up that giant. That's great. It's like I'm on a construction site. You it's, know, just so. like it. it's just like it. Now, can you max that screen out, or is that a limitation of? It comes out. Yeah, it's a little. It's a little tiny bit. Different the balance happens. is a tiny bit up there. Okay. Oh my gosh. Sweet mother of Jesus. Sweet mother of the eight pound six ounce baby Jesus, please. <laughs> Turn off the machine. Please stop. <laughs> okay, speaking of the eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus, Neil, how do you feel about abortion? I think we should talk about that first. Come out of the gate with something that really gets me feel. You know, something that's kind of very a softball, not a lightning rod question. It's pretty, we're pretty straightforward here. Yeah. And just roll right into capital punishment. Right? We'll just go abortion, death penalty methamphetamines in your neighborhood uh, from there. Um, these guys are literally picking up sawdust and putting it into this giant machine. They love to run One the, guy just went like this. They love, <laughs> they, love, they love to run the cutter. They absolutely do. Okay. All the big branches are gone even though the machine is running. Um, Alright, so in summary, um, why did you become an attorney? Like are we, what, what, are we what rolling age, here? Yeah, we're rolling right okay. now. At what age did you say, um, this is something I think I'd like to do? Uh, pretty early on I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. It does give you an opportunity to help people and as you think about it over the course of a 30-year career, there are cases that stay with you. Most of those cases involve the, the death of a loved one, a family's grievous loss. Um, and there are other people that are very seriously injured uh, that make effort at rehabilitation over the period of months and quite honestly even years uh, in rehabilitation hospitals. Um, it really is a privilege to represent those folks and to help them uh, and to restore their lives uh, to the best measure possible. Um, there are some critics who may say, you know, oh it's just about the money, people are greedy, they want the money, but isn't it more about really taking, people are filled with fear when something devastating happens and how are they going to take care of themselves. Isn't that more about what it is that you do for these people? I tell people all the time that we meet with our clients at their lowest ebb. They come to us with their families, their children, they're broken, they're battered, they're injured, they're afraid, they don't know what's going to happen to them physically, emotionally, and economically and they come to these conference rooms of ours or we meet with them in homes or hospitals 
and they utter those magic words, can you help me please? And we do our best. And, and every day it's a battle. Every day it's a privilege and it's an honor to do what we do. I, I don't want to go on about this forever, but I, I'm, I don't believe there's any higher calling than standing up for people that have been wronged and injured. And uh, we have a dedicated team of professionals. We do that every day, and I think we do it in a very effective way. There's a, a wide range of types of cases that you see. Um, obviously, there are car accidents, and, but there are also truck accidents, motors. Can you kind of talk about a lot of the different types of personal injury cases that you've seen over your career? Sure, there, there are a lot of areas. Uh, we do Social Security disability. We do workman's compensation. Um, Michael O'Donnell in our office is board certified in those areas, uh, particularly work, workman's compensation. Uh, so we help people that are injured at work, uh, we help people that are disabled, uh, we help people that need uh, to quite honestly navigate the, the, the safety social net of those types of programs. And we're honored to do that. And then of course you do have a lot of motor vehicle uh, related uh, collision incidents, trucking, tractor trailers, motorcycles, uh, automobiles. and um, all of the, uh, the nuances uh, th that that brings to bear. Uh, medical malpractice, um, premises liability, you know, we just represented a woman who was in a store and th the roof literally caved in on her. Uh, so there are areas of uh, practice in, in, in all of those arenas and we're well versed and prepared to do that. I'm sure that people don't want, they would rather say like people say, well, you know, you got so much money for your case. Wouldn't do a lot of people say, I would have rather never had this thing happen to me, but since it has, but since it has, I made the right call, and you represented them in a way that best suited what their needs were. I have to be honest with you. I don't know of a single client that would have not preferred to go back and not have the injury. There's not one person that I've represented that wouldn't go back to the day before the injury and allow things to go forward without being injured. And I think that's universal. And I have to be equally honest, most of our cases, people come because bills aren't being paid or their doctors aren't being paid or they can't get the treatment that they need. And then there's a group of people come because they don't want this to happen to another person. Uh, uh, land defects where fences should have been erected over cliffs. Uh, you know, we went to verdict on that case and the driving force behind both of the families where these were one young man was fatally injured and another sustained life-altering injuries was we don't want that to happen to anybody else. We want to make sure that, that, that a fence gets erected. So most times, quite honestly, it's, money is not a driving factor for our clients. Most times, they simply want what they're entitled to by the way of medical benefits or wage benefits, um, or at the same time, they want defective conditions corrected and rectified. Are you comfortable when you go in the courtroom? And, what, and where does that level of comfort or what's, what's the word? Confidence. Um, confidence, just the ability, the, knowing that you know where you're at, knowing that you know the landscape. How much of that has come from doing this for 30 plus years? I, I think there's some of that, and I, I, we like to be in the courtroom. I'll, I'll be in the courtroom in a half an hour from now, um, and it, it, it's a great honor to be there. But every time you're there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a level of attention and anxiety and preparedness, and all of that comes together and it, it keeps us moving. And it's a, it's a great honor to, ta to be in court with people, um, and I'm pleased to do it every day. And it, it, it's, uh, it's exciting, um, it can be rewarding, uh, but it's technical. You know, a uh, great basketball coach one time said, it's not about having the will to win, it's having the will to prepare to win. And that's Coach Bobby Knight. So for every hour you're in the courtroom, there are multiple hours behind that with regard to preparation. There are a lot of law firms in this area. Why should I call Neil or Kathy or Michael? Well, there are a lot of good lawyers and great law firms in the community, and I'm pleased to count those plaintiff's lawyers and the defense bar among my friends. But relative to uh, people calling us, um, I can represent to you that no one will work harder, uh, no one will advise you more directly, and no one will work more promptly to bring your case to a resolution. Uh, we're pleased with our team. Uh, we're thrilled to do what we do, and we regard it as an honor and a privilege to meet with every client 
uh, and make a determination on what's the best course of action for that person. So each case is important. It's not a pipeline. You're not pushing people off to a B team or a C team or paralegals, right? You're the ones that are on the front line with these clients. Is we, that right? Yes, we work hand in hand with all of our paralegals, all of our secretaries, all of our professionals. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the folks that we represent are dealing directly with us. Um, what are some of the, like when, when a verdict, when a, when a settlement amount, when an award comes down that maybe is unexpected, can you recount how your clients reacted? Yes, uh, I can recount that with, with specificity. Or generally at the end of it, our people know one thing, that we went to battle and uh, we did our level best and thankfully, uh, more often than not, the outcomes are uh, successful and the outcomes are satisfactory. Uh, but there's a, uh, you know, th there's a lot of work uh, in preparation for that and uh, the clients come to see that and, uh, and in my view, uh, they really respect and appreciate the effort. People come to you in such an emotional state. How do you, what do you say to them to try to take the emotion out and move forward and kind of comfort them and guide them? What is that interaction? In many respects, uh, in a case of death or serious injury, it, that emotional process has to play out and uh, we facilitate that and we're here as, uh, as listeners and I, I believe that that's the counseling function uh, as a lawyer and we take that very seriously. But I mean, people are literally at wit's end, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you, what do you, what are the, what's that first, what do you say to them when they first come in? Well, when they first come in in the face of an enormous tragedy, there, there's a comforting function. And uh, I think you just have to let them know that we're going to work through this um, and achieve the best possible resolution. And many times that, that at, particularly at the beginning, um, it can sound hollow and people, uh, they're crushed. But you, we, we do our best to stay with our clients and to uh, make sure that they're getting everything that they're entitled to. Uh, and keep them advised and updated on their case. Um, I, I think that's a very important function of what we do. Uh, we're in regular communication with our clients. We make a business practice out of sending uh, copies of communications. Uh, we return our phone calls, uh, we return our emails, and we keep people updated on where they are. And in answer to your question, I think that they derive, folks derive some satisfaction to know that their case is moving and that their lawyers are on the job. So how do you make it easier for people to get in touch with you when something tragic has happened? What do they, what should they do? Uh, they can certainly call our, our main line, 570-821-5717, or contact us through our website, uh, o'donnell-law.com. Uh, re we are readily available by email, phone call, um, and uh, we'll make appointments and we will do home and hospital visits uh, where requested. So it's not just, well, you're not just here from nine to five. This is, uh, I'm mm. sure you've been contacted at all times. No, this is not a nine to five job. And I tell a, a lot of, uh, we, we make a point to have a lot of college interns. Um, and I tell them all the time that uh, this is like having a, a busy job and a busy hobby uh, all combined at once. People need you, you need, they need, you need to be available to them. And there's a lot of night work and weekend work and uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Anything else? What am I missing? Yeah, so good. <laughs> um, how would you describe Kathy, personality-wise? Oh, Kathy is awesome. Yeah, she she's a great lawyer. Uh, she's a great. Uh, she runs our practice. Uh, she's the uh, firm administrator, and uh, in addition to that, she has her own law practice. Um, quite honestly, I met Kathy on the first day of law school, and uh, I. She, uh, I relied on her to get through. She's a great lawyer. Super smart, uh, JD, MBA, see around the corner, smart. Um, and Michael, what's his personality like? He's the best. Uh, Michael O'Donnell is a sensational lawyer. Um, he is uh, attentive to detail. Um, he's professional. He makes a great appearance. He makes a great presentation. Uh, at, a, at a very young age, he's been, become board certified in workman's compensation. Uh, he tries his cases and 
uh, really goes to bat for his clients. A, a great young man, a great young father, a great husband. I can't say enough about him. He's in addition to being my nephew, he's my godson. All right, so I need kind of a closing statement that kind of wraps it up. Okay. What I would say is when, you know, people, when people are devastated by some of the most horrific events that cause such traumatic injury, the people that we've represented, those people that we've represented, we can never guarantee how it's going to turn out. But because we work so hard at what we do, we have a great track record. And, you know, if you want to know what we're like, ask the people that we've represented. Basically, kind of like, the proof is in the client. Okay. The proof is in the outcome. Even though we can't guarantee what's going to happen, every case is different. Ask our clients how, 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 how hard we're going to work for you. Uh, when you talk about our practice, we, we do advertise and we make ourselves available uh, on the internet um, and uh, we, we take that function of advertising seriously. But I'll be quite honest with you. We get most of our cases from the referrals of satisfied clients. Uh, people that we've represented, people that have seen the long, hard hours of preparation and the real passion and effort and resources that go into those cases. Um, and there's no higher compliment that's the, than someone who has uh, come through that gauntlet, uh, has been injured, has suffered a serious loss, and we've stood with them. And that person, uh, 18 months later or two years later or three years later, still thinks so highly of what was done here in our office that they uh, recommend us to other people who have uh, been injured. It, it really is the, the, highest, uh, the highest compliment. Uh, the, the other thing that I would say about our practice is that I've been doing it 30 years. I'm in my 31st year. I feel that uh, I have the same passion as when I started. It's a real privilege to represent people. Uh, it's an honor to stand with them at their lowest ebb. And we take all of those obligations seriously. So if you've been injured or if a family member's been injured and you feel that you would uh, like to, to call to discuss the case, please don't hesitate. We'll be here for you. Wow, that was perfect. I couldn't have wrote that. I know. Was chatting. Am I looking in the lens or looking at you your face? right in the lens. Okay. Okay, you look great. Um, how did you know you wanted to be an attorney, Kathy? Well, you know what? I was always very good at debate and arguing with teachers with regard to points that I thought were important, especially like in American history or social studies. And everyone I ever spoke to was like, you should be a lawyer, you should be a lawyer. The funny thing is I also really liked math and I liked accounting and I liked tax and I liked business and that was actually my undergraduate major. And so what do I want to do after I graduate from college? I thought law school would be the best way to combine everything I enjoyed and I was right. Plus, I was also lucky enough to find my husband. Tell me about that when you met Neil in law school. Great day, greatest day of my life. We actually met on the very first day of law school, very first class. I sat in the wrong seat uh, behind him and he turned around and we just started talking and became great friends. Our first year of law school and by second year of law school started dating and we've been together ever since. Um. You have seen a lot of cases come through these doors. I have. Right, a lot of different types of cases. Are there any particular cases that stand out to you in terms of this person's life is a disaster because of what happened to them and nobody knows how this is gonna go but we're gonna do our best. Well, Neil and I talk often about the fact that because we've been in business for you know, over 25 years, how many clients we've had who have been so severely injured but have survived the accident? Um, and what are their lives like now? Um, of course, at that time, when you're trying the case, you speak of and you get a lot of medical opinions and you get medical evaluations about what kind of future treatment they might have. But we'll talk about, okay, it's a cold day. We're a little achy. What is this person like who had to have a spinal fusion? What is this person's life like who had to have a complete hip or knee replacement um, just as a result of this accident and how crippling that's been on them. And unfortunately, not only physically, but the emotional toil it's taken on their families. And we've seen ex now spouses because it's been such a grave consequence on their lives. 
in, in total. And so I think that's something that you never forget and that you reflect on are the absolute tragedies who have come to these people who have done nothing wrong, just basically been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and now their lives have forever been tarnished. And it's not something that's going to get fixed. You go into a courtroom or whatever negotiations that are involved to try to get a settlement for these people, you're representing them. What do you bring with you that you've been able to attain over 30 years? What kinds of, what attitudes, what skills, what do you bring with you into that negotiation? Or courtroom? Well, I actually think that we all bring to, with us a great combination of compassion and being a zealot for our clients. Um, and what I mean by that is you have to realize where your client is. It is such a scary thing to not know if you're ever going to be able to go to work again, what your relationship's going to be like with your spouse, with your children, with your grandchildren, with your friends. Um, you know, we have people who have wonderful social lives, able to do so many things, hobbies, not just work, but hobbies that they love and that they appreciate. And let's face it, that's the quality of life that we all look forward to. And now they don't have them and they don't know if they're going to be able to return to them. So you have to be able to put yourself as best you can with your client in trying to understand that, to understand all of the frailties that they're facing can't give them the magic answer and say that everything's going to be okay, but that we're going to do our best in order to make it so. Not only with medical care and making sure that they are able to receive the medical care that's necessary, because let's face it, that's a fight too in today's society. So being able to get and advocate for them to receive the appropriate medical care that they need and the best medical care that they can attain. And then, on top of that, being able to be a zealot for our clients, being aggressive, being fierce, and dealing with opposing counsel, with insurance companies, and with everyone who stands in the way of trying to restore this person's life. That was a great answer. Um, how does it make you feel when you win a case? Well, you know, first of all, I think, again, you look to your client because they have more in this than you will ever be able to have because they have their whole lives at stake. No matter if it's a case where they fully recovered by the time that the case resolves or if it's been sometime after that where their lives are, are not going to be able to be fully repaired, you look at your client and when you see that they feel validated, that finally people outside of their counsel and outside of their family have seen that they have been hurt, that it's not their fault, and that they are going to receive what only thing that you can in the, the American civil justice system, monetary recovery for their injuries, when you see that and you see that kind of appreciation and gratitude in validation, I think that's probably the best feeling that you can ever receive from uh, looking at your client's face. Neil also mentioned that a, lo a lot of your clients want to ensure that this doesn't happen again to somebody else. Absolutely. I mean, I know of a family who was instrumental. Um, you know, they lost a child, which is just unbelievable and unimaginable. And they not only wanted to, you know, take care of what remedy was necessary for um, that incident in and of itself and the absolute shattering effect it had on their family, but they wanted to see what they could do in order to prevent anything like this happening in the future. And so the firm and Neil were able to work with her and able to contact the appropriate legislators, make them understand why additional legislation might be necessary. And through that process, um, there was actually a law that was passed in order to um, make penalties for people who are leaving the scene of an accident much stiffer. And so in that way, um, yes, the ripple effect can be very great. Mm. What's it like, I mean, it's probably not as dramatic at this time in our history, but what was it, what's it been like in your career being a woman in this field? Well, you know, it's, it's um, funny. When I was in law school, about a third of our class were females. Um, when my daughter now is in, in law school, some 30 years later, 
um, on more than half of the class is women. As a matter of fact, more than half. I think that that's an interesting point to make is that actually now males are, you know, the minority with regard to her particular law school class. And I think that's just a wonderful, just in a generation that we've seen a wonderful increase in female lawyers. I think what's also very, very interesting is that you know, women have a lot of choices, a lot of choices that they want to make with regard to their careers. Some of them, you know, some of us want to be full-time lawyers. We want to go all the way. We want to be partners. We want to work, you know, the 18 hours days. And to be able to have that ability and not be judged any differently than a man is so gravely important. But what's equally important is to have other choices and other variables, both as men and women, in order to make your families work and not feel guilty about that, not feel like it's somehow you've copped out and taken an easy road because you've chosen to take a different path still utilize all of your education and all of your career goals, but also be able to have the attributes of raising the next generation. So I think that that's what I've seen is so much more flexibility and acceptance with regard to women. But I will not lie to you. I still see that when we walk into a courtroom, we walk into a settlement, you walk into a hearing, we are definitely sometimes judge differently. And a lot of that has to do with the age and the composition of the court, there's no doubt. And the fact that that fabric is changing significantly also helps. But you have to keep that in mind and you have to keep that in the back of your mind that human frailties are still existing and that there's still a lot of education um, for society to come to. That there are differences between men and women, yes, and we embrace those, but that when it comes to education, intelligence, and being able to fulfill your career goals, there should be absolutely no difference and no judgments. I want you to take that just a little bit further. <clears throat> I'm sure there are clients that come in that are like, oh, you're a woman. That brings a level of comfort to me. Or Neil's a man, that brings a level of comfort to me. But when you get in the courtroom, you guys are equal partners. You're both, you both bring your A game, right? There is a level of comfort in that knowing, oh, there's a woman that works here with those sensitivities. There's a man here that brings whatever sensitivities he would bring. But really, what matters is what happens when you go to represent, your, when you go to the map with your client. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, some of that is personality. Some of that is empathy. Um, I work with estate work. As I indicated to you, I have a, a business background, so I do a lot of the estate work, the estate planning, estate tax. Um, unfortunately, some of our clients are decedents, and so I deal with families who are grieving, who need advice legally. But I think perhaps from a female perspective, they are able to... Um, say some things and indicate some things about how they're feeling and some some needs that I might be able to fulfill um, on that level. Um, in addition to, you know, coupling that with Neil's expertise um, in dealing with what do we do next legally and, of course, understanding that from an, uh, an empathetic and compassionate perspective goal, but getting it to the next um, level with regard to how litigation should proceed in order to protect the family's rights and defend the decedent in the action. Something that has nothing to do with gender, but something that both you and Neil share that I'm sure you bring into certain cases is being a parent. Absolutely. What it, how does that impact how you approach certain, what passions you bring? What, how does that affect you? Well, I think that everyone, um, you know, understands that the death of a child, no matter what age that child is, even if it's an adult child, and um, when the family comes to you, it is definitely something that you need to, to take a praise and, and take stock of because you need to treat this family and whatever concerns that they have perhaps differently because a parent is going to be in a different situation. They're going to perhaps feel guilty. They're going to look at this as if it was their fault, regardless of if they were in the car or not in the car in a different state. They feel the need to somehow protect even this decedent child and perhaps the decedent child's family. So I think being a parent in and of ourselves, you put yourself in that circumstance and you, you, you try to remember what they need outside from the litigation standpoint. And there are things that they need outside of the litigation standpoint. What they want you, of course, to defend um, their child with regard to 
what happened in this action um, and what justification there is for uh, retribution. But at the same time, there is so, there are so many emotional components. Oftentimes, those are medical components that we ask them to seek help with. Um, and I think that that's an important component to not ostracize someone with regard to their grief. It's natural and it's something that should not be sort of shoved under the, the rug. It is a natural consequence and part of the healing, again, in defending the decedent child and recovering what is necessary in order to justify whatever rights they have, also is taking care of this parent or parents um, and, and, and even a wife and, and other surrounding family members, making sure that they are receiving the medical attention that they need so that when the matter is fully resolved, they are on the path to being as fully resolved as they can be. They will never be the same. They will never be the same, but as best as you can be. What would you say to somebody who is in a situation, they've had something devastating happen to them and they are thinking, I mean, there are a lot of attorneys to call, why call you? I do think it's the personal attention that we bring. Neil, when Neil started the firm, it was just him, and of course every case was Neil, and he embraced it, took it on um, 100%. I was able, when I was able to join the firm, it was the two of us. Now that you know, we have a, a third attorney, we've built a staff here of over 11 people. All of us, though, you're not a number. And I think that that's what's most important, is that you're not just a case number at the top of a file. You are a human being who is going to be able to speak to another human being with regard to your concerns. Some of the concerns may seem small, some of them are astronomical, um, and the fact that there is that personal attention that we all meet and discuss every case on a consistent basis. Um, Neil touches, feels, embraces every single case that comes into this office. The same thing with Michael, the same thing with myself. We know the cases that are here. You are not just a name on a file. And I think that that makes a big difference. Are there larger firms? Are there smaller firms? Absolutely. But here in our office, you are able to be a person who is going to be heard. That was perfect. Um, final question. Are you proud of what you've accomplished on behalf of your clients through your career? I am. It, it's, it's wonderful to work where we are in, um, you know, in Wilkesbury, Kingston, Scranton, we run into so many of our clients, um, past clients, um, having dinner or at a movie theater, and it's wonderful to see them, you know, a decade or sometimes two decades later, and realize that yes, their lives have moved on. And of course, as I say, they are not the same as they were. 10, 20 years ago before the accident, but they are in fact living life and embracing life as best as we all can. And so it is wonderful to see people and oftentimes, frankly, to have that validation of them saying we remember and we thank you and it was such a tough time for us. And you know, you have to remember what people we deal with are injured, they're on pain medication, they are not feeling their best, they are scared. So when we are dealing with people, we are not dealing with people who want to just have a pleasant conversation. So you have to keep that in mind, that these discussions are professional discussions and that you have to be able to listen. And to have people tell you, thank you for listening, as I say, 20 years later, it's a wonderful feeling as an attorney to know that you actually had a positive impact on someone's life during the most devastating time. How do I get in touch with Kathy O'Donnell? Well, you can reach us here by phone, 570-821-5717, or my email, cro at o'donnell-law.com. Okay. Are you, is this 9 to 5, or can I get you when I need you? You can get me anytime. Yep, we are never, we are always, with regard to even the office number, 24 7. Perfect. Oh my. <laughs> it's like perfect height. All right. You just gotta have a conversation with me. It's like the camera's not even here, but although we're gonna, we're gonna guide you toward the lens. All right? Yes, sir. Um, let's get our mic in place. <coughs> Everything else good? Everything else looks great. Good, swing that in. Good. Michael, Michael, what did you have for breakfast? I didn't have breakfast today, but if I did have breakfast, it probably would have been oatmeal. Sure, that's what you said now. Okay.
All right, how did you, what, what made you want to become an attorney? Well, honestly, um, spending time with my uncle and uh, seeing the way that he helped people uh, that he had been representing at that point in my life, um, probably, uh, I guess, 15 years ago at this point. Um, you so know, you're pretty young. I, yeah, I'm 35. So. so how about, I was pretty young when I started thinking about becoming a lawyer. So I would, yeah, if you're asking me, I was pretty young when I was thinking about becoming a lawyer. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Um, I started working with my uncle when I was in high school, and that, I got a, a bird's eye view of what the practice is actually like. Not something that you would see in a textbook or something that uh, you know somebody else would tell you about. I actually had that firsthand experience, and uh, it really opened up the door for me to to know that that was going to be my path in life. And um, with that, there was no doubt that I was going to do workers' compensation, personal injury law, uh, disability, really the things I've been focusing on for the last 10 years. How are Neil and Kathy as mentors? Uh, second to none. Um, the kind of answer, if you can kind of give me the, the question and the answer, because so, okay. you're not going to hear me. Okay. All right, so. So how were Neil and Kathy as, uh, as mentors? They were absolutely second to none. Uh, it was, it, that's the beauty of working with family, is that I had an opportunity uh, that other folks uh, perhaps would only dream of. I was able to get right into the mix, uh, even as a student, uh, helping out with cases, meeting clients, uh, and, and really serving the people that come to us for, for their legal needs. And then uh, once I got through law school and was able to actually start working with them, practicing as an attorney, I hit the ground running, taking depositions, meeting with clients, um, really doing everything that an attorney does without having to wait uh, uh, years to go through some of the more mundane parts of the practice. I was actually uh, getting right in uh, both feet and uh, it, it hasn't stopped for the last 10 years. It's been great. Is there a part of practice that you prefer or like or specialize in or are certified in? As far as certifications go, uh, I am certified uh, as a specialist in the practice of workers' compensation law. Uh, that's a designation that was handed out by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court several years ago. Uh, there's actually a, a very limited number of, of us who are out there. Uh, the last I checked, I think it's in the low 200s uh, of uh, tens of thousands of attorneys that are licensed in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I, I spend at least half of my practice uh, assisting injured workers. Uh, but beyond that, we also uh, do a fair amount of work on behalf of folks injured in motor vehicle collisions, uh, social security disability uh, clients, uh, and, and uh, really the whole whole spectrum of personal injury law. What does it feel like personally to you to get a client, an award, a verdict, something that they really need to be able to get, start putting their life back together? What, is that, what does that feel like for you? It's a, a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. Um, the practice of personal injury law for me, I had a friend say to me once that it's the greatest transition for somebody who is an athlete growing up. The competition, uh, being in, in the, 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 the battle, the fight, um, really standing up for a cause uh, or for a person. So uh, it was a natural transition for me. And uh, whenever you get a great verdict, a great award, a great judge's decision, uh, that's the culmination of a lot of hard work. Uh, and really, you can see it in your client's face. You know, they, they've, they've worked for it. Uh, they're in the battle with you. I tell all of our clients, we're teammates in this process. We're, we're working together, and, and one doesn't get to the end without the other. Uh, so when we achieve a, a, a combined goal like that, uh, really, there is no greater satisfaction, and it's um, it, it's the logical transition uh, to you know from my upbringing to where I am right now. It just fits perfectly. The workers' compensation the clients that you represent are these people that don't want to work. What's the situation? That's a, a common misconception. Uh, many times, uh, uh, insurance carriers, employers, people who we're doing battle with. Uh, create this faulty assumption that people come uh, to workers' compensation lawyers or bring workers' compensation claims because they're trying to avoid work. That couldn't be the furthest thing uh, from the truth. Actually, the most common uh, explanation I hear from new clients is that I just want to get back to work. I just need the assistance to do it because the insurance carrier is limiting which doctors I can go to. Uh, they're telling me I can't take certain medications. They're telling me I can't pursue certain avenues of treatment usually the more expensive treatments like surgeries and things like that. Uh, and what we're able to do is to really uh, open their eyes to what the law provides for them and allows them to do. And uh, quite honestly, uh, more often than not, when folks come to us, they have a, a quicker transition to work than if it was just relying on the insurance company, their nurse case managers, and the people who are designed to really ship them back to work sooner than they're ready. That's a great answer. 
Um, in t is there a case or two cases or a particular case that stands out for you where you said, we as the team, as O'Donnell Law in totality, we need to bring our A, a game to this. This is going to be a tough one. In terms of needing to bring our A game, uh, I don't mean to sound cliche, we've got to do it on every case. And, and that, it's, that's just the fact of the way it is because that old analogy of the David versus Goliath mentality, um, the insurance carriers have unlimited resources. They have unlimited people. Uh, we have a, a great tight-knit practice here where we are, rely heavily on one another. We have great paralegals, great legal secretaries, uh, great file clerks, great support staff, great interns. And when you put that team together, and then your client, uh, the individual who this all revolves around, uh, and when we, when we put our, our project together and we put our case together, uh, it, it's extremely important not only to us, but it's extremely important to the people who have entrusted us with their, their representation. So it, um, every case is extremely important. Every case has its own individual challenges. But at, at the end of the day, there's not really one particular case that, that sticks out. I can say that the cases where there's a little more animosity, a little more blood pumping, uh, certainly those cases uh, really get your attention. Uh, but at the end of the day, when people come in and say, I need your help, we've got to be in 100% uh, uh, because if we're not, we're, we're not doing justice for our clients. That's a great answer. All right, how has, how it has becoming a father changed your, your viewpoint when you're particularly like a, somebody who has to provide for their family, somebody who has to protect their, or their child was involved in an accident or an injury. Like, how it, do you bring that viewpoint into how hard you fight? The last 12 months uh, have certainly changed for the better for me. Um, I, I became a father in the last year, and uh, having my, my now one-year-old uh, in a couple days, uh, old son in the picture, you hear people say it, that it changes your perspective on everything. You don't really know what those words mean until you experience it for yourself, and I'm living it. Um, I couldn't be happier, and I think it's actually catalyzed and helped boost my career because what you start doing is you start realizing the things that you do in your professional life, how they feed into your personal life and your family life. Uh, but what you also realize, or I'm realizing, is that yeah, I'm using my time more wisely now because whereas before my son was here, it was easy to spend uh, 14 hours, 12 hours at the office uh, on any given day. Um, now I wanna make sure that I have those hours to spend with him uh, and I wanna have both of those dimensions to my life. So it, it, it makes you use your time more wisely. Uh, it certainly uh, adds an extra layer of uh, pressure but uh, importance to, to the work that we do in helping the people that we help because um, by providing good representation to our clients and getting good results for them, that's what's going to put my son through college someday. So we got to make sure that um, we're, we're, we're using our time wisely and we're also uh, doing great work for our clients so that we can conti continue to do that into the indefinite future. But being a parent makes it easier for you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody whose child is affected, the whether they need to provide for them through workers' compensation or whether there's been an accident. There's absolutely no doubt um, that as a new father, uh, when a client comes to me and they're in a similar uh, stage of their life as, as I am right now uh, and they're talking about putting food on the table or being able to get back to their career, uh, the level of empathy and the, the ability to understand what they're feeling and what they're going through is on a new level for me now. And I try to take that empathy and channel it and use that to provide the best results for our clients uh, because really uh, I know what they're going through and um, I try to put myself in their shoes as if my career had been taken away from me. Uh, we've got to fight like hell to make sure that they can get back to doing what they were doing before they got hurt. That's an awesome answer. I love that one. All right, um, how do I get in touch with Michael O'Donnell? The easiest way to get in touch with me is by phone. Give us a call at 570-821-5717. Uh, I have my cell phone uh, connected into our email system. Um, I'm always available by email, which is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at O'Donnell, O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L, hyphen law dot com. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to help in any way possible. Did you like being an attorney? Love it. Wouldn't trade it for anything. Give me that whole sentence. <laughs> Do I like being an attorney? I love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Perfect. You I love being an attorney. <laughs> I love being an attorney.
feels a little cheesy. Not gonna lie.